Hey guys, welcome to the Believe in Eagles podcast. I'm Lee Mayock, and for those who are watching, you can see that I'm here with my dad, Mike. Um, dad, what did you just ask me before we started recording? Um, are we going to be father daughter, or are we journalist and former GM? What are we? Doing? <laughs> guys, he really asked that question. Um, we are obviously being father daughter um, with like. Like it, it just it's more fun that way. I feel like everyone does journalist, front office man, or whatever you want to call yourself these days. But um, thanks for being here. I'm excited to have you. <laughs> um, okay. Anyway, so here's what's going on. I feel like everywhere I go right now, and for a while now, probably since you stopped being with the Raiders, anywhere I go, I get two questions. Okay. Number one, are you dating anyone? Number two, what is your dad doing and where is he? And so obviously I'm not going into, I'm absolutely the hell not going into number one, but number two, like, let's just dive into it. Like, what have you been up to? What are you doing? How's your life? Tell the people. Who are you dating? Dad. What? Come on, I'm serious. So, so I am too, because you could have chosen to ask, just ask the question without including yourself in it. But since you have I'm trying to be I'm trying to be open and vulnerable. Well then tell us who you're dating. I'm not dating anyone. Well, why not? Great question. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. Moving on. So can you please tell us what you're doing? What's your life? What's your off season been like? What are you doing this season? Like give us the rundown. I'm in a good place. Um I think as you get older and you kind of try to figure out what retirement or semi-retirement looks like for you. It's different for everybody. And I've had this conversation with a lot of people like my age. You know, what does it look like for you and why? And my whole thing, and you know me, hon, I mean, I was scared to death when the Raiders fired me that if I didn't get back into something immediately, you know, how do you go from 100 miles an hour to the speed limit overnight? And I was worried about that because I'm, I'm the speed limit. You don't even you've never even done like you've never even remotely done the speed limit in terms of work. So I feel like it's even harder than. That. Yeah, that's that's my point. It's, yeah. So. I think the smartest thing I ever did when the Raiders fired me, I still had a year left on my contract and uh, I had several opportunities to get back into football as a consultant or an assistant general manager or whatever. And my head was telling me and my emotions were telling me, you got to take it. You got to take it. You might not get another chance. You better go. And I kind of took a step back and said, you know what? I, um, you know, at that point I was what, 63 years old or two or whatever. And I was kind of like, if I jump right back into this five o'clock in the morning till whenever at night and seven days a week, and if I jump back into that, I'm going to just climb back in that tunnel and disappear again. And I, I didn't really want to do that. I wanted to step back out and uh, I'm happy I did. And what's evolved out of that is during football season, like starting about now, plus or minus August 1st, you know, I'll be going to training camps, getting ready for some NFL teams. I did games for Westwood One Radio, which I love to do, NFL games. It keeps me in the loop, watch NFL film, talk to my buddies around the league. Uh, and I also work for Sumer Sports as a consultant where I write college scouting reports on players. And you know me, I've been writing college scouting reports since before you were born. Um, so at the end of the day, what it allows me to do is from about August 1st till February 1st. I'm working real hard on football, which I love. But then in February 1st, you know, it's, it's time to relax and uh, play some golf. And uh, Mandy and I went down to Georgia last year, and we uh, I played a bunch of golf, which I loved. And uh, that's kind of the plan. I'm, I'm doing more games this year. I'm going to be working for Sumer Sports, and uh, I'm excited. Um, okay, question, though. That what? How did you decide that you weren't? How and why were you going to? How did you decide that you didn't want to go back into that like 150 mile an hour NFL life? Because that's a hard decision to make. And how did you even get there? I think had I been 10 years younger, because mm -hmm. I was kind of pissed off at the end of that Raider thing. Um, yeah. Same. And you, well, thank you. Um, 
but you you kind of want to show people that you know you know what you are and your 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 ego is hurt a little bit and you're a little bit pissed off and frustrated um had i been 10 years younger i probably would have said let's go i'm going back in and we're going um mm-hmm. and let's see if we can you know get back to it again and um if if you've been a player a coach a gm a scout uh, in the NFL, it's hard to replicate that. And I was lucky enough to be a player for a short time. And the energy, the energy, I've seen the film. <laughs> I know the energies, the energy of being a player is off the chart. Um, and the closest thing to it is to be a coach or a scout or whatever. So I've enjoyed that on both ends of it. And it's hard to replace. And I was worried about replacing it. Um, Are there things that you still miss big time from that? I miss the people. Yeah. I mean, but do you get it? Do you get like, is that what you mean by um, when you're calling these games for Westwood? Do you get like a kind of a sprinkle of that? Yeah. And that kind of makes it worthwhile, I guess. Yeah. The, the closest funny I had um, lunch with Bill Pullian down the Jersey Shore mm-hmm. last week, who's a Hall of Fame GM. Anyone? Yeah. Isn't he kind of like, I don't know, lack of a better word, a mentor of well, yours? Well, I, I mean, I've just known him over the years and he and I have always gotten along and he's been great to me. And um, he's 81. His, he's sharp as a tack. I love it's fine. We sat there for an hour and a half and having lunch down the shore and just story after story after story. We're laughing and comparing notes. And I've always learned so much from that guy. And you walk away from it. You get in your car. You go, man, that was energizing. That was, yeah. <laughs> that's different. And those are the kind of things that I probably will always need in my life. And part of it's because your grandfather was a a high school and a college coach. And Mm -hmm. since the time I was eight years old, I was following him around the practices. So my entire life, I've been on football fields. I've been at practices. I've watched tape. I've evaluated players, but the one constant are the football people. Yeah. And so I miss, last week I called a bunch of them and welcome, wish them well for next season, you know, like the Rich Passaccias and, and those kind of guys and Gus Bradley's and a lot of my guys just, Hey, go get them, have fun. Good luck. Uh, well, do they, but then when you talk to them, do you hear any of the things that they're going through? And then you're like, oh, thank God I'm not doing this right now. Well, just a little bit. I, yeah. I mean, I've never been afraid of hard work, you know, but, but it's, yeah. it's been kind of fun to take a step back and not have to be part of that grind. Um, mm-hmm. But so part of me goes, man, I miss that grind. And part of me goes, whew, I'm really happy. I don't have to worry about somebody going down with a knee and replacing the 90th man on the roster with with four tryout guys and trying, you know, and, and going. Yeah, like once your head starts going down that road, like I'm sure there are little, like things that trigger you. You're like, oh my God, I'm so glad I don't have Yeah, there's some things where you kind of like, you just kind of go, oh man, you know, why just cutting players, you, you know, you've heard me talk about it and. I was cut several times and trying to cut a player is like, to me, it's like you're carving a piece of your heart out as they are when you're talking to them about it. And um, they're just, they're parts of the job that are really hard, but there are other parts where you're just sitting around talking football with a, with a beer in your hand and you're the happiest guy in the world. Yeah. Is there a scenario or a world where you would get back in with the team? I'm not saying necessarily as a GM, but maybe as a consultant or just more, more cl- working more closely with the team. I, I don't know, Lee. It all, it all depends. I think I'm really happy where I am. Um, yeah. What I've told people that have asked me that question from around the league is like, for me, it's all about the people. And if the perfect situation came ar- around, and I don't even know what that perfect situation is other than it has to be with people who I really like and really respect. I mean, that makes sense. Right now, you seem pretty good with golfing. <laughs> I suck at golfing, but I like the challenge. <laughs> well, so do you feel like when this time comes around, like training camp time, like AKA the Eagles are in training camp today, yeah. um, it does that does that get you a little bit? Yeah. It's funny because I used to tell people, and this was before you were born, like when I was 25. So like not that long ago even. Um, do you want me to make it public? <laughs> No, no, I will cut it out. <laughs> yeah, enough. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Before you were born, and you know, as you know, my career got cut short at like age twenty-four or five because of knees. And for about the next five, six, seven, 
summers, like every time July 1st rolled around, I felt like it was time to go to camp. You know, like, what are you doing? Are you running your sprints? Are you doing this? You know? And it's the same thing for, with the NFL network. And when I was doing the draft for them and then with the Raiders, it was kind of like, once you get into July, it's like summer's over, whatever summer you got. And it's time to go back know, to it's work. Depressing. It's depressing. I know. Okay. So if you were to put on your G, like your front office GM hat again right now, what are the things in general? I know it's different team to team, of course, like situationally, but going into a training camp, what are front offices looking at? Like what's top of mind? What do you even care about for the first week or whatever? You know, going in there, what early days, what what matters? Number one, it's it's injuries. Every team in the league, if you see the the waiver wire, not the waiver wire, but the wire, uh, you'll see players being put on NFI or PUP, you know, mm-hmm. injury lists. Um, and as an executive or a coach, it's what are their status, bringing the trainers in. Are we looking at a week, three weeks? Can they participate in training camp? I mean, you look at the Eagles and, you know, they put Sidney Brown, who was a rookie a year ago, but had an ACL at the end of camp last, excuse me, at the end of um, the season last season. year. You know, he's on the PUP, their second round pick, Cooper DeGene did, I don't know if, what he did, but he's out for it. I think, I think it was a hamstring. I read hammy and hand, so I don't know which one it is. Um, and when they say, I have a question, this might be a basic question, but when it's a non-football injury, does that just mean it could be a football injury, but it wasn't at the facility, it wasn't with the team? It had nothing to do with it. Like he could have hurt it working yeah, out. Yeah, he was hurt. He was playing basketball or lifting or working out yeah, on his own yeah. or whatever. Um, yeah. and PUP is physically unable to perform effectively. Yeah. They're the same thing as long as the player is able to go before week one of the season. Um, but so to answer your question, you're worried about the injuries early in camp. That's number one. Number two. Wait, actually, did you see Landon Dickerson? Um, I will never interrupt a guest like that unless it's you. Just, I just, in my head, I was like, whoa. I actually been did thinking you- you've been pretty good so far because typically it's a lot I just, more. I just got excited. Um, and because you were talking about injury, did you see that Landon Dickerson and his wife had a party at their house on two, yesterday or whatever, this week? It was a slip and slide was- with other people on the team. And his wife wrote like a cute Instagram thing. And at the end, because of course she has to deal with people like like caring about everything. Yeah. And she was like, everyone is happy and healthy. Everyone stayed safe, whatever. And then now Landon has a toe laceration. And I'm like, that 100% happened on a slip and slide. Those are scary. The, the funny thing is, is it's, and what that is, is team building. And I give Landon Dickerson, and I interviewed him when he was coming out of Alabama. And he's an impressive kid. And- he, he's a natural leader. So basically he's inviting guys over before camp starts to get together and bond. And it's always, so cute. but it's also even, I would say funnier or cuter um, when the fat guys get together and take their shirts off and roll down a slip and slide <laughs> because you're talking about 330 pound guys sliding all over. <laughs> that is a, that is an interesting choice of activity. Oh, trust me, yeah. the O-linemen are the funniest. They just crack me up. And and Landon Dickerson, I give him a ton of credit. And they're just having fun. And yeah. that's part of team building. And No, I just didn't know if you saw that or I not. I did, but... believe it or not. How about that? Yeah. Wow, I'm surprised. I'm surprised. Um, okay, before I rudely interrupted you, you were talking about what you cared about um, as a yeah. front office guy, early days of camp. Injuries. When the Eagles are looking at, they have some injuries. Like, are there – are you already looking at positional battles or like I'm talking early, early, is it really just who do we have? Who's hurt? What's going on? It's really keep in mind, you're coming off OTAs and mini camps. You can't, yeah. you kind of a pretty good feel for what the positional battles are going to be. And um, you're anxious to see how your young guys, your rookies, first year players, the new guys that you haven't seen in, in pads yet live, you're anxious to see how they react. Okay. How, how do, well, does that make it more annoying that Cooper is hurt for now? Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, okay. Very annoying because on yeah. top of the question of Cooper is how good is he going to be? How does he react to it? Um, he's a second round pick. And in my opinion, he can play outside corner. He can play nickel. He can play free safety. So what you're really trying to do with a guy like him is figure out where he fits. Place him. Yeah, and yeah. then there's the piece of the puzzle. Like I said, Sidney Brown. 
he's hurt. Mm -hmm. So he's not there. Who's playing there? You, you got back um, C.J. Gardner-Johnson. Are you playing him at nickel or at safety? So there's all these movable parts, and the more guys that are hurt, the more difficult it is to get answers. Yeah, especially when it's those combos where one person is deciding someone else's Yeah, it's a trigger. Spot. Right, it triggers yeah. a different yeah. position. A domino. Yeah. 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 So I think the young guy thing is really critical, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I think so that's – to me, it's injuries. It's how the new guys are shaping up. It's positional battles. Do you have new coaches? How are they doing with your guys? You know, the Eagles, that's that's a big deal with their two new coordinators. You know, they've already met them. They've been with them in OTAs and minicamp. But now you're on the field and you're trying to develop a football team with pads on. Um, you're trying to create a culture. And this is really the beginning of it. So do you think that um, obviously they're – projecting themselves as like on the same team, everything's copacetic, but do you think it really is that way with um, Kellen Moore now calling the offense over Nick Sirianni? Do you think they're on the same page as much as they saying they are? Well, I, whenever you, you, you come off a Super Bowl two years ago and you start the next year, 10 wins, one loss, and then everything goes to hell. Yeah. And you go from a Super Bowl team to a 10 and one team to a team that gets killed by Tampa in the first round of the playoffs, and it's not even close. A team that you beat week two or three in the season easily. Um, so the Eagles' issues are magnified compared to most teams regarding, okay, new coordinator. This is their second new set of coordinators in two years. Um, you know, reportedly, Jalen was tight with Brian Johnson, don't don't really know that I wasn't in the building, so I don't know. Um, but I feel bad for Jalen Hurts because he's an intelligent, hardworking guy. It really matters to him. And it seems like every year since he went to college, he's had new coordinator. And obviously that's not literal, but I'll bet you he's had right. six, seven new coordinators in 10 years. And people Wait, that's kind of crazy. Lee, people underestimate how hard that is. That, that'd be like you working your tail off to, to speak French and spending a whole year doing nothing but speaking French. Très bien. And, and then the French guy leaves, and now you start dating the Spanish guy, and you got to learn how to speak Spanish. And how, now what? How did you, why did you turn that analogy that way? Go figure. They can learn my language. Oh, okay. <laughs> Actually, I really would learn their language. Yeah. Okay. But um, also, yeah. Okay. That – people don't talk about that enough, I don't think. It's just really um, – Jalen, I think, is so intelligent. It matters so much. But you got to give him a chance. So there, I think there's a lot of pressure on Kellen Moore this year, to be honest with you. Um, well, at least now Jalen has like a lot of weapons. Like I'm so excited about Saquon. Well, you're a Penn State girl, so I get that. And that's right. That's right. And I think I'm even more into this story right now just because I like, well, I'm seeing a lot on social media and him and Jalen have been working together a lot in the off season. And then just to see watching hard knocks this season, getting to see the backside of everything, how it went down, like how maybe he thought he was treated, how, what the Giants thought, what the Eagles thought. Um, have you been watching Hard Knocks? It, I'll tell you what's funny is I just did the last two episodes in the last day. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so episode three and four, I think, of the Giants offseason. And two things jump out at me because, as you know, uh, my first year with the Raiders, we had Hard Knocks at training camp, which I hated. Um, that, that was so brutal. Do you know that I haven't been able – okay, so, like, in case you people are listening or watching and they don't know what I'm talking about – um, my dad was the first year GM of the Raiders. They were still in Oakland in 2019, yes. right? Yep. Um, John Gruden head coach it was his second year and you guys are hard knocks is coming, um, for training camp for you guys. And you had just signed Antonio Brown, correct? We had traded for him in the off season. Trade, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so you're, you are. And for people who don't know you that well, you're just so type A controlling guy, needs everything in its place, needs everything. Da, 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 da. That would be your and opinion. And so now. Yeah. That would be your opinion? Yes. Okay. okay. 
So now you're getting, and this is a new, like you weren't a GM before you weren't an assistant GM before this is a completely new role for you. And there's a lot of like parts that I'm sure you had, had no idea you were even part of the job and you're trying to put it all together, trying to present as your best self for yourself and the team as the new person. And then you have hard knocks coming and filming it while you have a very um, eclectic new signee, new tradee coming in. Um, how did you even handle it? Because all I know is that I, the only reason I watched Hard Knocks that year, and I love Hard Knocks with my whole entire soul. It's like my favorite thing until you guys got it when you were there. And I only watched to like do damage control after. Like I was just always so worried and so scared. I didn't know. I just, it just gave me a lot of anxiety for you, for public perception, for, I, I definitely cared too much about it, but all of that to say, I, that was the last Hard Knock season I watched until this season because then I was excited about the NFC East. But um, what was the Hard Knocks life like for you? So the background is the NFL can force certain teams to yeah. do Hard Knocks. And every year, it's usually, mm -hmm. it might be five teams, six teams, eight teams, but there's a criteria which they draw from. And that year, we were one of the five or six teams. And everybody was all excited about the Raiders training camp because John Gruden was a coach, a TV guy. I'm coming in as the GM, a TV guy, um, you know, promised to have a lot of craziness. Antonio Brown, we traded for. So they asked us if. Wait, and did you before before Hard Knocks started, were there issues with Antonio yet? Like, did he do the helmet thing yet? Or was that. When was it? Like, what was the timeline of those antics? As soon as we traded for him and he came in for OTAs, um, he he basically had his old Steelers helmet with him, which was no, long, no longer um, a certified helmet in the NFL. And so the NFL was changing over to these different helmets for safety reasons. And players had, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 different certified helmets to choose from. And I got a phone call from our equipment guy that Antonio didn't like any of them and wouldn't wear any of them. And this is in the off season. And that kind of started like he wasn't going to participate. He wanted his own helmet. Um, he was going to sue the league. He was going to sue us. Um, you know, all kinds of stuff was going on. So all this is in the background. And the league wants to know if we would host hard knocks. And I said, hell no. Well, no parts of hard knocks. We're and also another, a little bit more backstory. You You're, you got your start and your like comeuppance in this media world with Steve Sable and NFL films. No one respects NFL films more than you. No one. I just, all I know is growing up, you, you just, that group and that company, you had nothing but the best things to say of them. So it took a lot for you to, I, I just, I know that you didn't want to be disrespectful to them because you could not respect that team more. It's, it was just the concept of them coming in at that volatile time in your first time as a GM. Well, that was nice of you to take the words out of my mouth. I, I just said, I wanted well, people to know well, no, you're not a hard knocks hater. No, no, no. Let me, no, I was about to say, I spent a lot of years at NFL films. Steve Sable was a mentor. Everybody in the league trusted Steve Sable. Every owner, every GM, every head coach. He would never throw an NFL person or team under the, under the bus. Um, and I knew a lot of the cameramen and producers and people who do hard knocks and have nothing but respect for them. They're awesome. But they have a job to do. And that job is the opposite of my job, which is to keep certain things from becoming public and keep certain things in our building. So part of it was I, I respected the hell out of this group of people. And they, by the way, they do a great job. Um, but John's team, the year John Gruden's team, the year before was four and 12. We were going to turn this roster over and get a lot younger, a lot more physical, hopefully, hopefully uh, a lot quicker, twitchier. So there was going to be a lot of stuff going on. And I didn't think it was the right place for a new GM with a new roster. It might be good for the people at home, but my, of course. <laughs> my goal 
as I told Mandy the night before I left for camp, is that I want to be the least seen and heard GM in the history of hard knocks. That's my goal. I love hearing that. <laughs> but so the, the, the segue to that whole thing kind of is, okay, you go into camp and they're really good. And they're, you know, after two or three days, you almost forget they're there. Because, yeah. But it's hard to forget when there's a, you know, a 10 foot boom bike over boom mic over your huddle every time catching, you know, Max Crosby and I are singing some song, you know, while he's stretching and giggling and laughing and there's a mic right behind him. And I'm like, what are we doing here? You know, so there's, a, you know, there's that's harmless. I'm not that's fun, cute stuff. Yeah, it's fun. But yeah. at the end of the day, um, they they have a job to do and. I told them they couldn't come in to see the final cuts and they were very upset about that. They found some other ways to get around that, which pissed me off. Um, so at the end of it, it didn't end very well um, because they felt their job entitled them to, 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 to find out cut day their way. And I, I said adamantly, that's a private moment and you will not get in my office. So, it, you know, so anyway, Lee, that's tough. so to get back to your original question and try to tie it together, I've watched the Giants, and what's ironic to me is as bad as I thought it was for me with training camp, because this was an off-season hard knocks, the yeah. Giants, yeah. there are no players around. So there are no player storylines that can take up a lot of time on hard knocks. So what it becomes is all about the GM, Joe Shane, the head coach, Brian Dayball, and all their guys. And yeah. I was kind of amazed at what got out there. You know what? As far as behind the scenes, and it's it's fascinating. It's great for people like you and me at home watching. Um, but I think it put a lot of pressure on Joe Shane, to be honest with you. And and uh, again, I would hate if I was a GM. I would hate that. I mean, do you, how do you think though? How do you think they as a whole handled the Saquon situation? Well. I was just watching what three or four, I forget which one. And yeah. what Joe was trying to do with the agent was say, Hey, we can't come to you today and give you the money you're asking for. So why don't you go to the market, find out what that market is for him and come back to us and see if we can, can meet that. Cause we want to keep Saquon as a giant. Um, and, and, I think Joe sent the right message to the agent. I just think it's hard when all of a sudden that's out, you know, at the, after it's over, everybody's seeing it and parsing every word and everything the Giants said in the background. And, okay, if we don't get them, then we can use the 12 and a half million here, here, and here. And that's how business is done. And But, but it's just um, the hard business reality of the NFL is that running backs don't get paid. Sa Saquon's been hurt a little bit and the Giants were willing to go to a certain level. And now the Eagles have them because, and they're a division rival and it's a great storyline. Uh, Let's go. <laughs> I, I know it, it's, but it's such a hard thing. And, and I, I just hate to see it kind of played out publicly like that. Yeah. Because then it made me wonder too, when testing players like that in the market, do they do they, do you think a lot of them are grateful for that or for that, for that opportunity, that freedom and opportunity, or do you think they're, t they take it as kind of like, that's rude. Like they want to, they, you, you know what I mean? Well, it's human nature to, to want to be wanted. Yeah. Okay. And when you build a relationship in a football building, it's deeper than a relationship typically at most businesses. You yeah. know, you draft a young player, he plays well. You, it mean, you know, you talk about the brotherhood, you talk about building a championship together, and we all buy into that, whether you're a mm -hmm. second-year player or a 60-year-old GM. We're all buying into that, right? And relationships get formed. Players get tight with other players. You're trying to grow together. And if if the GM or or – um, the business side of a pro team tells your agent, look, we can't get there. Go ahead to market and we'll see how, you know, we'll see what happens. That can hurt a player's ego, justifiably, yeah. justifiably, right? And so if Saquon was upset by that, I get it. 
I think I think most players take a step back and say it's a business and I'm going to let my agent handle it and I'll come in and make the decision at the end, but it's a business. And that's why you see players handling things different. Some players will not report to training camp, will not participate without a con- contract. Other players say, hey, I want to be with my brothers and I believe we're going to work something out. That's the player's prerogative. The manager's management side prerogative is is saying, hey, we can't pay you or we're going to cut you. Or and it's a t- At the end of the day, it's a relationship business, but it's also a tough business because of that. Well, I'm glad that the Eagles were on the, the winning side of this, at least for now. I can look at it that way. Um, do you think that – what do you think the offense is going to look like now with Saquon there under Kellen Moore with Jalen and the weapons that they have? Yeah, I'm, I'm anxious to see, Lee. Um, you know, Jalen's always been kind of a zone read quarterback, and um, he can run, he can throw. Uh, bottom line is that if you look at each of their position groups, the wideout group, they've got two of the best wideouts in football. They've got one of the top tight ends in football. They've got one of the best running backs in football. They've got a top 10 or 12 quarterback in football. Um, the O-line, they've got maybe the best O-line coach in football, Jeff Stoutland, but they've got a couple question marks there. You know, they're, Cam Jurgens is a guy they drafted in the second round to take Kelsey's place when he retired. So he's moving into center from guard to take Kelsey's place. And that opens up the guard spot. And uh, the kid Steen is going to get the first shot at it. But they also signed, and you and I were talking about this a couple of weeks ago. Mackay? They signed Mackay Becton, yeah. who reminds me a lot, if you remember Trent Brown with the Raiders. Brown, yeah. And he's similar in that he has to keep his weight under control. He's got to be fired up and in great shape. and But when he is... He's so talented and so big, he can be dominant. So I'm anxious to see what Stout can get out of him. And they're they're cross-training him at guard. So he could end up playing guard and back up swing tackle. Um, But the bottom line is he's got to be in shape and ready to go. So to answer your question offensively, um, there's a couple of questions in the offensive line. They've got to get, they've got to maximize Jalen. I think that's the biggest challenge is Kellen Moore getting the most out of Jalen. Uh, And if they do that, you know, they ought to be a top five offense in the league. I mean, and then speaking of people that need to like keep, stay in shape, then isn't Jalen Carter another on defensive wise? um, What's, what are we looking at right now at camp in terms of the defense? Well, let's, let's talk about the two Georgia defensive tackles, Jalen Carter. The, the, um, what do they call them? The Philly Bulldogs. Yeah. Right. (laughs) I mean, that, that Georgia program has been churning out big time players and Jalen Carter to me, when I watched his tape at Georgia, um, I'm not saying he's the next Aaron Donald. He's different body type, different everything, but he's so quick. He's so explosive. His hands are so strong that if he's in great shape and dedicated and ready to play every single snap of every game, he should be not just a pro bowler. He should be an all pro defensive tackle. That's how much talent. Whoa. That's how, okay. Mark that down. That's, well, that's how much talent he has, right? The guy next to him and his college teammate, Jordan Davis, that's the guy that really needs to get in shape and stay in shape. Mm-hmm. When I saw him, his whatever year it was in college, junior year, he was too fat. He was 350 pounds. He was kind of just a guy. And then when he lost. A jag? What? A jag. A jag. Yeah, he was a jag. But <laughs> the last year, he lost about 20, 25 pounds played his ass off, stopped the run, pushed the pocket a little bit in the pass game. He's the one that needs to get in shape, stay in shape, and play more snaps. So I'm I'm a big believer in in that uh, Jalen Carter should become one of the two or three most dominant defensive tackles in the league, and that the other kid, Jordan Davis, needs to take a big step forward, staying in shape and being present and available. I think it's really cool that they have each other, though. Like, you know, just the, cause you, you drafted teammates. Yeah, but didn't you? I mean, have each other. They got a whole defense full of Georgia Bulldogs. I mean. Yeah. They, that's what I mean. Yeah. Teammates, they have each other. It's the things that you're talking about, staying in shape, staying motivated. I think it's way easier to do when you've had that chemistry yeah. with your teammates already. They know when you're down, they know when you're kind of sloppy. They know like, 
I, I just feel like that's a great way to, I mean, the team, the team building that you were talking about is already there. So they have that. And I just think that is invaluable. Yeah. And it's, it's to your point, there's so many Georgia Bulldogs on this defense, you know, Nicobe Dean probably going to be an off the ball linebacker starter for them. Um, Nolan Smith, who might be, nobody's talking about who I think is probably going to show up prominently as an edge rusher this year. Um, you know, they've got the corner they drafted in the fourth round two years ago. They got so many Georgia dogs in there. Crazy. It's time for, yeah. And I, I love Kirby Smart, the head coach at Georgia. Uh-huh. I love their program. You know, I, I I think they're all going to be really good players. This is so fun. Honestly, I'm really excited. Why? For this year. For this year. I just think it's going to be great. Should we go to training camp together? <laughs> of course we should, Lee. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, we'll film some. We'll film it. No, I won't film any. Okay, fine. Then we'll talk about what we saw after. <laughs> Is that okay? That sounds fair, yes. Okay, cool. Well, um, I have things to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Honestly, Dad, I had so much fun. Thank you for chatting with me. I know Philly's going to love hearing your insight more so than mine, but um, I'm really excited to, you know, go through the season, talking on the pod, talking Eagles football with you. I'm excited for your opportunity, and I hope you maximize it. It's a great, great opportunity, honey. Okay, well, um, oh, do you know that I'm dog-sitting right now? Yes. Near you? Yes. Do you want to get dinner? Camp tonight. Ooh. Okay. But next, All right, well, that ends it, guys. Please um, like, day subscribe, day. and tune in for next week's <laughs> episode. My dad might be on. He might not be. <laughs> Thank you. Love you. Bye, hon.